Hi, listeners. Welcome to the Grief Out Loud podcast produced by the Dougie Center for Grieving Children. I'm Jana DeCristofero and wanted to give you just a little heads up as you listen to this episode, you'll be hearing references to our old name, which was Dear Ducky. So just so you don't get too confused, you're listening to the right podcast and we look forward to bringing you even more great content under the Grief Out Loud name. Thanks for joining us. Hello, and welcome to the Dear Dougie podcast, produced by the Dougie Center for Grieving Children. I'm Jana DeCristofero, and thank you for tuning in today. This podcast is meant to open up the often avoided conversation about grief. While we'll all experience loss during our lives, when it occurs, most of us don't know how to feel, what to do, or even how to talk about it. So whether you're grieving a loss or wanting to support someone who is, We hope these podcast conversations will lead to a better understanding of grief and ideas and inspiration for how to show up for yourself and those that you care about. So today's guest is Sue Klebold. Sue is the mother of Dylan Klebold, one of the two shooters at Columbine High School, who in 1999 killed 12 students and a teacher and wounded more than 20 others before taking their own lives. Before publishing her recent book, which is called A Mother's Reckoning, Living in the Aftermath of Tragedy, Sue spent 15 years excavating every detail of her family's life and trying to understand the crucial intersection between mental health problems and violence. Instead of becoming paralyzed by her grief, she worked to advance mental health awareness. Sue is also donating all of her profits from this book to organizations that promote brain health and prevent suicide. Sue, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jana. In preparing for our conversation, I realized that we're talking just less than a week after the mass tragedy that occurred in Sutherland Springs, Texas, in which a man shot and killed 26 people and wounded many others. We're also just a month and a few days since the shooting in Las Vegas at the Harvest Music Festival that left 58 people dead and over 500 injured. I know in my work... When I talk with people who have had a really public death, every time a similar tragedy occurs, they get thrown back into their own grief in a new way. And I'm wondering, how do these events and the countless others that have happened since Columbine affect you? I I like to think sometimes they don't, but they always seem to, even when they kind of catch me off guard. Um, I have this sense always that um, because someone I loved did something incomprehensible, I'm always aware everywhere I go that incomprehensible and terrible things can happen. When my tragedy happened, I lost sort of a sense of permanent safety and immortality that some of us have. So I'm really always aware that such things could happen. But when they do happen, I always I, I'm reminded of just the horrible days and months and, and even years after the tragedy. I think about all the people who have lost loved ones or who who are watching loved ones suffer and hoping they'll get better. And I think about the shooter, and I always wonder what this individual's story was, what he or she, usually he, had to cope with. Um, was this person suicidal or not? And I think at this point in my life, I'm almost, I sometimes have an almost academic approach to it to try to understand how these things happen and how these shootings are very complicated and different, how they differ and what might have been done to prevent it. So as many of us are, you know, listening to the news and watching the coverage and wondering, you know, why, why did this happen? It sounds like for you, you're wondering about the shooter and their motive maybe has more depth and complexity than perhaps some of us who are just watching it and wondering, oh my gosh, how could something like that happen? Right. And I, and I think you've hit on the key word there. When a tragedy like this happens, people are always asking why. And they look for simple, simple solutions. Like there was a trigger, you know, somebody broke up with a girlfriend or lost a job or, uh, you know, some simple precipitating event that could explain this. We can't ask why and get simple answers. What I have learned to focus on over the years is to focus on how. How does one's thinking deteriorate? What are the steps somebody goes through so that they are in a state of 
complete um, disorganization, disconnection from from self-control, from conscience. And at that moment in time, they have access to means that can do this. So I'm much more focused on the process of how something like this occurs rather than looking for quick fix answers of why. Yeah, it reminds me in the your TED Talk that I had a chance to recently rewatch, which is really amazing. And I'll link to it in our show notes. And hopefully listeners will be able to watch it as well. Mm-hmm. You go through so many of the questions that you really wrestled with in the aftermath of Columbine of, you know, why Dylan did what he did and why you didn't see it coming and, and what did it mean about you as a mother and as a family? And I I wonder how the switch from the why questions to the how questions influenced or changed your grief in any way. In the beginning, everybody was asking why. And uh, our governor went on national television and made the statement that, um, that, you know, it was the parents' fault when something like this happens because everyone wanted a quick answer. In the beginning, I was looking for quick answers too. I wanted to know why it did happen. And I was looking for a single factor. Well, this happened because of bullying, or this happened because of something I said or didn't say. I went back and looked through my whole life and tried to think of every conversation I'd had. And these kinds of things are normal, especially when you lose a loved one to suicide. Uh, The survivors really tend to blame themselves and ask themselves questions. But over time, and it did take a very long time, the more I read about suicidality, the more I talked with experts, the more I began to see that the falling apart of one's thinking, one's mind, is a process. It happens over time. and There are thresholds and steps that people cross. It's not just somebody said something that day and it made someone, you know, lose control and, and go ballistic. It doesn't happen like that. It is the end stage of a whole developmental process. It took me a long time to kind of grasp that. And once I grasped that, I never went back to thinking about whys anymore. In the beginning, very soon after the tragedy, I, not, I wrote letters to the families who had uh, lost loved ones in the tragedy or had had loved ones injured. And at that time that I wrote those letters in the early months, I really believed that Dylan either, number one, had been tricked or coerced and and really wasn't there on his own uh, volition, his own choice. But the other thing I believe was that something in him had snapped, that, that, that something had happened to his thinking instantly that had changed his thinking. And I believe that, and my letters reflect that, because I, I refer to uh, Dylan did this in a moment of madness, because I hadn't let, yet learned how that was a, a sort of a myth that I'd latched onto. And how did that change things for you when you realized that that was really a myth, that it was a moment of madness? No one has ever asked me that before, and I love that question. (laughs) I think what changed for me was feeling that there is opportunity to prevent something like this because it felt so random and, you know, one in millions that something like this could happen And when I believed it was something that could just turn on a dime and happen because of some fluke, something that occurred in his life, that was far more terrifying than learning that there were stages. He did cross thresholds. He got further and further along down this dark spiral, this downward spiral. And knowing that sort of gave me tools and ways to try to feel that I might help others and prevent these things from happening. That we have time if we can only identify the risks, intervene, say and do things that might help. And uh, in a way, that was somewhat comforting. In the course of the last 15 years, you've really stepped into a role of researching and exploring suicide prevention, suicidal thinking, homicidal thinking and behavior. And in in that work and what the people you've talked to and the things that you've learned, what are some of those risk factors or stopping points along the way? There are many things that might indicate that someone is having trouble, someone is having suicidal thoughts. 
For example, you might see a change in behavior where someone's usual school performance changes. You might see changes in sleeping patterns. You might hear someone refer to themselves as being burdensome to others or hating their life or wishing that they could die. You might see someone giving away things or saying, if something happens to me, would you take care of X for me? Um, there might be an increased use of alcohol and drugs, sleep patterns, eating patterns, just the things that indicate normal health. These things can be out of balance. What's hard to identify is that these kinds of behaviors are can be common in people, especially in adolescents. Their sleep patterns get irregular. Their behavior changes. They get in trouble suddenly where they weren't in trouble before. And what, what I have learned is that one of the most important things we can do, certainly as a family and as a society, is to have better ways of listening and better ways of communicating. So when we see something, we can ask about that and say sometimes when people do these things or say these things or experience these, whatever it is you're experiencing, they may be struggling with thoughts of suicide. Do you have thoughts of suicide? Is this something you're struggling with? I never knew that that was okay to ask somebody that. I never knew that somebody I loved could even be thinking about suicide. And so those are the things that, that I have learned and I try to advise people to do, is to be aware that what you see may not just be normal teen behavior. It might be a risk factor. That person might be really hurting inside and needing help, but not being uh, willing to ask for help or not understanding the uh, critical nature of what their thoughts are saying and they, that they need help. Yeah, and it seems like the, the key factor in that is not to assume in any direction that if yes. you're seeing a child who's suddenly sleeping in a, mo a lot more to assume, oh my gosh, they're definitely suicidal, but also yes. to not assume that's just normal behavior, I can ask, I can check right. in. Looking back, which of those factors do you now see Dylan having struggled with in a different way? As I look back, I believe that in the year before Dylan's death, he was starting to show some signs that something was wrong. But I was not savvy enough to understand that what I was seeing might be signs. Dylan was a kid who was in a gifted program. He was very bright. He was very self-motivated. He always sort of managed his life and was able to do what you know, his parents expected him to do. But in his junior year, he had a spot of trouble. He got in trouble at school for some vandalism. He scratched a locker. Um, he hacked into the locker, to the um, computers in the school system. And about the same time, he was arrested for stealing something with Eric. They stole some electronic equipment from a van that was parked on a country road. Now, Dylan had never been in trouble before in his life, and I was so concerned, and I remember uh, he ended up getting into a, to a diversion program instead of being jailed, and I remember asking the diversion counselor, does this mean something? He's never been in trouble before. You know, is there something here that I am not aware of? And I asked friends, I asked family members, and everybody pretty much took it in stride and said, well, boys get into trouble. They do impulsive things. Let's just watch it and see what happens. And I remember talking with Dylan and saying, Dylan, this is really a concern for me. What do you think it means? Do you think you need counseling? And of course he said, no, I don't need counseling. I will prove to you that I don't need counseling. I'm going to, you know, I will get my life in order. I'll get my act together. And that is exactly what he did. So from a behavioral perspective, he went to diversion. He got himself together. He had no more troubles in school. He attended, um, he applied to four colleges, got into the four universities or colleges of his choice. Every indicator was showing me that he'd gotten his act together. Now, I look back at that time and I think, that was our red flag moment. That was the thing that was telling us that he was in trouble, that he was drowning psychologically, that he needed help. We did, uh, I did read some of his writings that I saw long after his death, 
And when he was 15, which was a two, full two years before he died, he was writing about suicide, about wanting to die, about being in agony and wanting the pain to end. So he was hiding what he was feeling. The risk factors were there, but I wasn't seeing them. He did find a way to, for example, consume alcohol, but he did it in secret and I was not there. He did find access to firearms, even though we'd never owned any in our home. And purchasing or obtaining a firearm is another risk factor for suicide. But I was not aware that he had done this. So yes, he was showing risk factors. And the only thing that I might have seen was um, this change in behavior that occurred about a year before he died. The one thing that I tell people now, if I look back and I think of where did I fail in my heart of hearts, where I feel that I failed, is the way I communicated with my child. When kids are troubled and they go to their parents, so often as parents, we are focused on their behaviors. We are trying to say, pull your weight, follow, do what you're responsible for. You know, and as I said to Dylan once, you know, think about other people. You know, your behavior is selfish. I look back at all those things. I have deep regrets about that. What I wish I had done was just sit with him and shut up and listen and try to elicit from him anything that he would wish to talk about. And if he would have chosen to say one word to me, to not try to fix anything, not try to argue. For example, as a child, you might say, I, I certainly did this with my own mother. You know, I'm ugly. Nobody likes me. I hate school. And my mother would say, I think you're beautiful. Um, you know, I like you. And, you know, so what that does essentially is discount the feeling. I wish I had done a much better job as a parent of just listening, reflecting back, not jumping to try to fix my kids' problems because I was uncomfortable with their discomfort. And I believe that as parents, one of our important jobs is not helping our kids feel better, but just helping them feel and from what I'm what I'm taking from what you're saying is we have these risk factors, which are oftentimes based in behaviors that yes. we're seeing. And so as as parents or caregivers or adults in kids' lives, oftentimes we can respond with trying to contain or change or shape that behavior. But yes. the important piece that gets lost is sitting with and asking for and investigating what are the emotions that are right. underneath these behaviors. I think some of us are almost uh, afraid of knowing what our kids are thinking. And um, if we are talking to a child, we can ask, are you feeling suicidal? Do you wish that sometimes that you could just go to sleep and not wake up? It's okay to ask questions like that. But what we don't want to do is respond in such a way that makes the child feel uncomfortable that they've shared this information. We have to really practice our composure and being able to listen without freaking out. We have to be able to say, tell me more about that and ask questions. And that is what I wish I had known how to do. I wish I had known that that was something I might have done. As a parent, if you do take the time to sit with a child and ask about those emotions and a child says, yes, sometimes I do feel that way, what are some resources? Where would a parent go then? It will, it will depend a lot on, on what resources are available. I, for example, some school systems have programs, they might call them threat assessment programs or student support programs, where, where the parent and the schools can work together. They, sometimes the school identifies a problem. They might see a child writing something in a school paper that is violent or uh, suicidal. So that's one option. The, the thing that I want everyone to be aware of and to have this number with them at all times is you can always call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The phone number is 1-800-273-TALK or 8255. And uh, counselors are available 24-7 to talk about, to help people sort through what their level of risk is and what they might do. And if you can't get the individual to reach out for help, 
with you, you could always, as a parent, do this on your own and try to talk to somebody about how you can help this other individual. The Lifeline also provides a chat option. So for people who don't want to speak out loud and they would prefer to chat, that's something that an individual can access in privacy without starting at the level of mental health care. And experts can help families and individuals who are struggling to sort out what the level of risk is. They can help create a safety plan to keep the individual uh, from harming one, himself or herself. These are things that can be done before uh, someone gets connected to resources. And I will link to, I'll list that crisis line number that you mentioned, the 273 talk. Sue, I really appreciate all you know the insight and the wisdom you're sharing from your work and your exposure in the suicide prevention world. And I'm also curious, so often when someone dies of suicide and that person has also committed a murder, mm-hmm. the grief of the family who's experienced the suicide seems to go unseen or erased or invalidated in some way. And I'm curious from your personal experience, how did you make space for your grief in light of such a public death? I had help. I didn't do this alone. The public death overshadowed uh, a lot of my own feelings of grief in the beginning. I was terrified of the media. I was afraid of meeting victims' family members face to face. And I would turn on the radio and I would hear people saying that, you know, we were disgusting people. And, you know, every, everywhere I turned, I saw and felt condemnation. And I fortunately found a wonderful therapist who was a grief specialist. And she pointed out to me that the most important job I had to try to recover from my loss was to allow myself to grieve to allow myself to love this person who other people viewed to be a monster. And we focused a lot on just my own grief and my own loss, and I had to consciously lay some of those other concerns and feelings aside to just remember that I had lost a child who was precious to me and allow myself to weep over that and and miss him and honor him honor the person that I knew and not the person who committed those acts he did at the end of his life. So if for, when I speak with other survivors of murder-suicide, I always try to, to remind them to allow themselves to love that person. And it's sometimes hard to do that when the whole world sees them as a monster. And it's hurtful when you have other people who are hating your loved one. But you need to allow space to love that person and send your love through eternity and and just say, I will love you all my life. It seems it's a process of making sure that the person, your loved one, doesn't become just one dimensional. Yes. And that you're able to still engage with them as a three dimensional person who committed this horrible, damaging uh, act against others, but was still someone who was important to you. Well, and when when someone dies by suicide or in a murder-suicide, we tend to allow the circumstances of their death to define who they were. And uh, we we see it as a choice, a, a, a malicious act, a destructive act. And really, they were victimized by their own thinking, and they are victims of of their own deaths. Remembering that and uh, remembering your love and allowing yourself to love all of that person, not just who they were in the last moments of their lives. Well, thank you so much, Sue, not just for talking with us today, but for all of the work that you're doing in the community and in the larger world field of suicidal thinking and behavior and helping other families to navigate such a challenging situation. And thank you, Jana. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And thanks everyone who tuned in today to listen. If you'd like to hear any of our past episodes, you can find us at dougy.org or an iTunes, Stitcher, or any other podcast platform you might use. If you have ideas for an episode, a topic you'd like to hear us talk about, please email us at help at D-O-U-G-Y dot O-R-G. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you'll join us again next time.
Thanks for listening. Music for today's episode was written and performed by Dr. Turtle and Lee Rosevere.